there is a tide in the affairs of men, which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted or the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. Welcome back to our ESMO 2023 Bonanza, featuring none other than your hosts, Michael Fernando and Josh Herwitz. Mikey, how are you today? I'm very good, Josh. I see from one masterpiece to another. And which masterpiece did I just quote? Sounded like Shakespeare. It is Shakespeare. Which Shakespeare? Hamlet? (laughs) That sound you're hearing, ladies and gentlemen, is the stunned silence of Josh as he frantically Googles his own quote. Michael, I was giving you enough time to think about it, but it was Julius she- Julius Caesar, actually. William ah, Shakespeare, Julius Caesar. Which, as the uh, Shakespeare aficionado that you are, I thought you would know this. Well, it's been a while since I listened to Caesar. <laughs> uh, but he loves his Caesar salads. Michael, I couldn't think of anything better to, talk, to, to start our episode, but why don't we knuckle down and talk about skin cancers today. This is an exciting area of development which i never thought i would say that apart from melanoma but there are other things apart from melanoma the classic melanoma that are seeing some great attention do you want to start our show absolutely you mentioned melanoma and it's interesting you do so because obviously the main driver behind melanomas taking the the role of the golden child in oncology as it were is immunotherapy and we're seeing a lot of similar stuff with cutaneous squamous cell cancers where immunotherapy becomes the agent of change. The first study that I wanted to talk about was the one-year follow-up study of a phase two non-randomized trial of neoadjuvant semiplumab for stage two to four cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. This study has actually already been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this update was concurrently published in Lancet. So clearly they're doing something right. There have been other studies of ipilimumab and nivolumab and semiplumab that suggest a good pathological response rate can be achieved by neoadjuvant immunotherapy for patients with resectable cutaneous squamous cell lung cancer. The primary endpoint was met with a PCR rate of 51%. The secondary endpoint was major pathological response rate, which was 64%. The ESMO presentation this year was presenting the 12-month EFS DFS, and overall survival and pathological partial response data. So just to quickly go over the study's design, this was split into two parts. Part one of the study were patients who had four doses of neoadjuvant semiplumab, followed by curative intent surgery, and that's where they got the PCR and the MPR data. Part two of the study was, by investigated discretion, patients could get adjuvant semiplumab, up to 16 doses, adjuvant radiotherapy, or just observation. In terms of adjuvant treatment, there's a a graph that we will obviously include a link to, but to summarise it, 12 patients who had adjuvant treatment with semiplumab had had a pathological complete response, one had had a major pathological response, two had had a partial response, and one patient had unfortunately been a non-responder. However, the majority of patients, 24 or 60% of patients who had had a PCR, actually had observation. 30% of patients who had had a major pathological response also had observation. 29% had a partial complete response in the observation group and three were non-responders. Only a handful of people had radiotherapy and there were a handful that were not reported. So, confused? So was I, but that's okay. We keep on going. Basically, the summary is that even after neoadjuvant immunotherapy with semiplumab, there were a variety of potential adjuvant, quote-unquote, approaches chosen. However, the results are very interesting. So the estimated 12-month event-free survival for all patients was 89%. But one of these groups is not like the other, Josh. See if you can pick it. In the pathological complete response group, the estimated 12-month EFS was 94.9%. In the MPR group, 88.9%. In the partial pathological response group, 100%. Admittedly, those last two were small numbers, 10 and 7 respectively. In the non-responder group, the estimated 12-month EFS was 72%. 
I know it's small numbers, but the partial pathological response having a 12-month EFS of 100% is interesting. But more importantly, that's quite a high EFS at the 12 months for the no surgery or non-responders if we have to really knuckle down. Why is it that what people who haven't responded are still having 12-month EFS? And I have no idea. Yeah, I suspect that it speaks to the semipl- the efficacy of semiplumab anyway, but honestly, there's no there's no real answer, and I don't think we have a definitive answer for that. But you will note, however, that the 12-month EFS for non-responders is significantly lower than in the other three groups, even though we're still talking about a 12-month EFS of 72%. In terms of the actual event data, and we'll focus on the non the no surgery or non-responder group. Two patients had progressive disease that precluded surgery in the first place. Two patients had disease recurrence and three patients died. This is significantly more or significantly higher than in the other groups where no patients in any of the responders groups, even the partial responders groups, had progressive disease that precluded surgery. Only one patient had disease recurrence and three patients passed away. The 12-month overall survival across all patients was 92%. But you can probably, reading between the lines, looking at this data, say that the majority of patients that did die were in the no surgery or non-responder group. There is a significant separation of the curves between the patients who were responders, even partial responders, and those who were not. In terms of safety, there was no real new safety signals, I guess. Uh, We have significant experience with semiplomab now, so it is not really surprising the rates of treatment-related adverse events in this study. There was one death that was possibly related to the study drug, but this was noted to be an elderly patient who had pre-existing cardiac failure who had an exacerbation. So to conclude this rather, we'll be honest, this rather messy summary of this study, but the conclusion is that the preliminary survival data is encouraging and potentially independent of the degree of response, so long as you have some response prior to surgery, even if it's a partial one. Adjuvant semiplumab was well tolerated. We know the neoadjuvant semiplumab was also well tolerated. And this did raise a question, which is whether we need to reconsider this current idea of adjuvant semiplumab at all. There is a study that it's actually running at my centre at the moment called the CPO study, which is studying adjuvant semiplomab post-surgery and radiotherapy. But does neoadjuvant semiplomab actually improve outcomes? Could we also increase the PCR rate by adding an EGFR inhibitor such as cetuximab because there is some data to suggest that checkpoint inhibition plus EGFR actually improves outcomes, but it hasn't been studied in the neoadjuvant setting yet. So there is a randomized phase three study that is due to commence recruitment next year. And it's part of an overall trend in skin cancer, head and neck cancer, as well as really oncology as a whole that is moving treatment towards the neoadjuvant setting. But neoadjuvant semiplumab, Josh, might be coming to a skin clinic near you. Yeah, the world is moving at rapid pace this year. I feel this year ESMO and ASCO have just blown everything previously out of the water. There's so many very unique and interesting publications. Would you agree? I would agree, and it really is a testament to all of the amazing men and women who are working on all of this data at labs around the world. I mean, we sit here in our chairs and we sort of yak on about them for half an hour at a time, but the amount of work that goes into these studies is truly, truly immense. So it is great to see all of these results and all of this data. Yeah, speaking of some great results, I'm going to switch tact to something that's a I have quite a soft spot for because I do a lot of the this treatment, but we're going to be talking about Tebentafas. And for those who have never heard of this drug, that's okay. It's pretty new. And going back three years, this particular disease had no effective treatments. This trial is titled the three-year survival with Tebentafas and previously untreated metastatic uveal melanoma in a phase three trial. So the background of this, and you're like, what? a uveal melanoma, essentially it's a melanoma of the eye, but it's gonna, it's different to that of classic cutaneous melanoma as it has very modest responses to immunotherapy. It comprises of 85% of all oculomelanomas, but makes up less than 5% of all the melanomas in the world. 
The thing is that prior to the approval of this drug, overall survival for these patients was approximately 6 to 12 months. And those with localized disease have a 50% chance of it becoming metastatic over a 10-year period. So Tepentafast is the first positive phase 3 study for metastatic uveal melanoma. It works by a T-cell engager with its design to redirect T-cells to glycoprotein 100 positive melanocytic cells presented by HLA AO2 to cell surface. So one of the limitations of this particular drug is that you have to have the specific HLA typing, which is present in about 50% of the Caucasian population. So if you don't fit that cohort, unfortunately, you're not going to be a candidate for this drug. The inclusion criteria, you had to have this HLA typing, no prior systemic therapy in the advanced setting, no prior LDT except surgery, and any LDH. So there were 378 patients randomized two to one to Tepentafast and investigator choice, which included pembrolizumab at 82%, ipilimumab at 12%, and decarbazine at 6%. Overall survival was the primary endpoint, and key secondary endpoints included objective response rate, progression-free survival, duration of response, disease control rate, and safety. Key inclusion criteria, I've gone through that already, but you had to have a good performance status and be over the age of 18, and they were stratified according to LDH. So let's dig into the results, Michael. I feel like I'm already at the results. This is crazy. The three-year overall survival in the intention to treat population was maintained. At the three-year mark, the median overall survival was 21.6 months versus 16 0.9 months with a hazard ratio of 0.68. And the median duration of response was 11.1 versus 9.7 months, and 32% of patients on Tebentafast arm maintained response for at least 18 months versus 0% in the immunotherapy arm. The disease control rate was almost double at 46% versus 27%, and the overall survival benefit is seen even in patients where the best overall response was progressive disease with a hazard ratio of 0.62. Looking at the exploratory analysis of circulating tumor DNA, 88% of patients had a reduction in CT DNA at nine weeks and 37% had a clearance of CT DNA at week nine. The correlation with survival had a hazard ratio of 0.32. So a pretty interesting biomarker to help predict response to treatment, methinks. When you look at the safety data, there was a low rate of discontinuation. The treatment-related adverse events was mostly in the first month and decreased thereafter. Michael, a question for someone who might not have used this before. What is one of those side effects of Tepentafast that you have to be very careful of? Is it fevers? It is not fevers. Dang, swing and a miss. Yeah, so it's... um cytokine release syndrome actually so most of our patients we will admit for the first couple of cycles for overnight monitoring because they can get really significant hypotension and as someone who's seen cytokine release syndrome for a, a couple of times not with um to vent to but other drugs it is very scary very very scary i think the uh, hematologists deal with this all the time with all of their treatments but we're lucky enough to have avoided it thus far in our careers so moving on to the conclusion, this is great. You know, it's it's the first drug that's been targeted for a rare sub rare cancer with benefit in the overall survival and even those that don't have significant response to their tumor. There are ongoing questions as what's the incidence of HLA in uveal melanoma? I think it's about 50% in the Caucasian population, but I'd have to sort of dig into that a little bit deeper. And then the question is, can they modify it to be used in other subtypes. Secondary to that, what are we looking at next? And there's actually some research looking at daravacertib and crizotinib that came out, I think, last year, which also shows some benefit in combination, but the crizotinib is quite toxic. So that's something to consider as a second line. This is still a very, very young treatment regimen, I think you could say, with no real historical better options. So it's an exciting front for UVL melanoma. And a shout out to uh, my professor, Anthony Joshua, that I work with. He was on the uh, 
the Nejem publication for this trial. So for our third study, we'll move it right along here. Before, when speaking, we're going to go back to cutaneous SCC. Josh was just too keen to speak about uveal melanoma. So we're going to jump back and forth a bit in our episode today, but we're going to talk about, to wrap up this episode, the ALICE study. Now, we discussed potentially the combination of immunotherapy with an EGFR inhibitor, such as cetuximab, and that idea actually, in part, was inspired by this study. ALICE is a single-arm phase 2 multicenter trial that aims to evaluate the clinical activity and safety of avelumab, one of our more niche immunotherapy agents, plus cetuximab in unresectable stage 3 or 4 cutaneous squamous cell cancer. The background to this is that, as has been mentioned multiple times before, immunotherapy has revolutionised the treatment of cutaneous squamous cell cancer. For those of you who don't deal a lot with squamous cell cancers and non melanomatous skin cancers, simiplumab is fantastic. The response rates are something in the realm of 70 to 80%, and it can do a lot of patients a lot of good. Historically, we have used anti-EGFR agents in squamous cell cancers, more in the head and neck variety, but the existing evidence is that response rates for anti-EGFR monotherapy range from between 10 to 31%, so not brilliant by themselves. Many patients do develop secondary resistance to immunotherapy, and there are certain subgroups, and the authors of this particular presentation highlighted anogenital cutaneous squamous cell cancer that don't respond well to checkpoint inhibition. So this was a combination study, as mentioned. The inclusion criteria were unresectable stage 3 or 4 cutaneous squamous cell cancer. They could be any line of therapy, so patients could be enrolled regardless of any previous systemic treatments. They included high-risk subgroups such as perianogenital primary tumours, and patients were given a two-weekly course of cetuximab and avelumab for up to one year. The demographics and patient characteristics were relatively well-balanced, with 22% of patients, with roughly 22% of patients having high-risk anogenital origin cancer. In terms of results... We'll start with safety. There were no new safety signals. So you're just combining the cetuximab and the avelumab toxicities, which we're very experienced with, and you're not getting any new safety signals from the combination. In terms of the clinical response, this was fairly quick. Obviously, with squamous cell cancer, it's not just dangerous, it's disfiguring. So if you have a response, you'd like it pretty quickly. The swimmer's plot demonstrates the majority of responses are fairly rapid and can be quite durable, and the combination appears to be effective regardless of the location of the primary or how many lines of therapy the patient has had. I would be very interested to see how many patients had actually progressed on previous immunotherapy in this study. I didn't have that data in the presentation, but it would be interesting to see if cetuximab would be another way of overcoming resistance to checkpoint inhibition, which is something that we've talked about a couple of times on this series. In terms of the overall response rate, there's a a table here that, of course, we'll link in. But in terms of all patients, 30% of patients had a complete response, 27% of patients had a partial response, and the overall response rate was about 57%. In terms of patients who were treatment naive, 68% of patients had some form of response, either a CR or a PR. Patients who were pre-treated, 34% of patients had some form of response. And in terms of the location of the primary, 55% of patients overall and 63% of patients with perianogenital SCC had some form of response. Important to note, as we always do, the disclaimer here is that we are dealing with small numbers. The median progression-free survival was 9.2 months, and the median overall survival was 15.4 months. Again, small numbers can be difficult to tease out some of the complexities and subtleties in this group, but encouraging numbers nonetheless. If we compare this to the similar phase 1 semiplumab data uh, monotherapy, which has inspired semiplumab to become a standard of care, the overall response rate was 47%. The complete response rate was 7%, and the time to response was 1.9 months. The 12-month PFS was 81%. So potentially higher rates of 12-month PFS, 
I didn't find any data in the sinitolumab phase one study about patients with high risk pathology, but you would assume that most patients actually had lower risk cutaneous SCC. So to wrap this up and to wrap this episode up, this is an early study, of course, but it does show promise with no unexpected toxicity. In terms of the clinical setting, following the emergence of further supportive data, you could consider this for high-risk patients or patients who are pre-treated. As mentioned, I would like to know how many patients in this study had already had immunotherapy. But there is obviously the potential for bias. The main highlighted point of this was the fact that patients who did not receive three months of therapy were actually excluded from analysis. So you're inherently excluding the people who are going to do badly, and that can affect your numbers. These results obviously need to be confirmed in a larger study, ideally with a comparator, maybe semiflumab monotherapy, who knows. But it is encouraging, again, use of old drugs in new ways and new combinations, which is a bit of a theme for ESMO in 2023, Josh. It is a theme. It's an exciting theme, though, because the theme is such that progressing through immunotherapy might not be the end of your immunotherapy journey, which has shown benefit and we just need to know how to tweak it. Absolutely. And even if we're talking about from a health economics aspect, you know, if you're using old drugs, they're also going to be cheaper than new ones. So there's really nothing to lose from trying to make new use and make more effective treatments that we already have. Josh, we're approaching the end of our ESMO journey, but would you like to tell us what we're doing next time? I thought you would never ask. We're moving on from the land of skin and you might have thought we'd forgotten, but we haven't. But gynecological oncology is our next destination where there is some exciting developments and I look forward to discussing them with you very soon. Can't wait. It is our penultimate episode and then we will be focusing on the best of the best as promised we will be focusing on the plenary presentations after that. And then I think Josh, you and I, we need a, we need a holiday. Just, Just a, a small, small one. <laughs> but join us next time for Gaini and then the day after that for the plenary session. We hope you will continue to stay with us on this journey. Thank you for listening to Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. You'll find previous episodes on our website, along with weekly posts, resources, and links to our Twitter and LinkedIn pages. Check it out at inquisitiveonc.com. That's inquisitiveonc.com.